Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to uh, just worship you. I know that we live busy lives. And sometimes we become so busy in life that we forget about the sustainer of life. And about the God who brought us into existence. And how important it is to worship you. We forget about what happens when creation worships the creator. And the connection that we make. So today help us to make that connection. Help us to feel your presence in this place. I ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit may descend upon this place today and that you may speak to each person that they may not only know or understand that, but they may also feel your presence in this place. That you may speak to them. That you may translate my words according to their needs and that everyone here today may be fed by you spiritually. And that they, Lord, may come closer to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. If you have your Bibles, if not, I want you to just go there. One of the things that I've noticed a lot, every time families call me because someone passes away in their, in their, in their family, they... They, uh, they invite me to their home to prepare uh, the service, to prepare the funeral service. And, and sometimes you see them digging around, trying to, to find something that I could say good for the family, for the person who passed away, that sort of, you know, to say that, that I've done, that, they, that they're okay with God. You know, and they're like, yeah, pastor, he did go to church one time like 10 years ago. So, and, and, and because there is the hope that somehow this person is going to be saved. And they look to see, you know, you know, I did see him read the Bible one day. I, I, and they look to see in this person's life if they ever did something that was worthy of salvation. That was worthy to go to heaven. And they're digging around so that I in my sermon of their funeral service could say something. Could say something positive in giving them hope that they're going to see this person again. The desire to be saved. I don't think there's anyone here today that if there is a heaven and that there is a God, that you don't want to be part of it. And here we see a young man who comes to Jesus and this young man, is a, he is a ruler he is sort of a professional person. Maybe we could say he is, he is, a, young, he is a young lawyer. You know, he is uh, uh, this young guy who comes to church. And he's only maybe 28 years old, single. You know, lawyer, professional, and at the same time, a good Christian, you know. You know, the kind, of, the kind of young man that when he comes to church, all the parents want to invite him to lunch, you know? All the parents got young ladies, they want to invite him to lunch. You know, because, hey, man, maybe we can hook him up, you know? And everybody's proud, well, he's a good Christian. Oh, he goes to church, he even preaches sometimes. Oh, my God, and he's a professional, and, and you know, he's got an apartment on, on Flagler, you know? I mean, he's making it. He's got, it, he's got it all together. He's, he's the full package. And, and, and as human beings look at him, as we look at him, 
We see people that they are the full package. They have the full package. Every time I talk to my dad who passed away, I always said he was a man with the, who was a full package. You know, and, and, and we sometimes we look at each other and the way human beings look at each other, we say that person has it all together for what we can see. And although this young man, everybody was saying how he had it all together. And he had that apparently. It seems like he didn't. Because you see, what's real, what's real is when you go home and you look within you and you look at who you really are within you and you look at what nobody knows, just you and God. And everybody could be saying all kinds of stuff about you, all good stuff about you. But the question comes, if they knew everything really about me. And this young man, he felt an emptiness. Because he comes to Jesus, here in verse 16, it says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? What good things shall I do so that I may have eternal life? His question was, what action could I carry out? See, this man was starting off with the wrong emphasis of how to be right with God. He saw that the way to be right with God was in doing good things. This young man was seeing that the emphasis of salvation was to get us to do good things. And isn't that the way we see it a lot of times? What can I do? And he saw that the emphasis, he thought that the emphasis of Christianity, the purpose of Christianity was to get people to act differently. And he forgot. He didn't know. And some of us don't know that. That the purpose of Christianity is not for us to act different but to be different. Can you see the difference? The purpose of Christianity is not to get us to do more things or to do holy things. It is to be holy. It is not the goal of Christianity to get us to do good things. It is to be good. And he came to Jesus and says, what good things can I do? There's a lot of good sermon, a lot of information here that we could preach on, especially when he says good teacher. And one of the first things that Jesus tells us, tells this young man, if we go to verse 17, so he said to him, why do you call me good? And the first thing he establishes is, no one is good. No one is good. <laughs> what is he trying to say? Listen, there is nothing that you can do to make you worthy of going to heaven or reaching salvation. In other words, Pastor Labrador will not get to heaven because I'm a pastor. I'm not going to get to heaven because I dedicated my life to serve God. I'm not going to get to heaven because I preach here every Sabbath. I'm not going to get to heaven because I've helped some of you in different ways. I'm not going to get to heaven because of what I do. Okay? 
I'm not going to tell you the reason I'm going to get to heaven yet, but those things will not help me get to heaven. I'm not going to get to heaven because I'm going on a mission trip July 20th to take shoes to children and medical help. That's not going to help me to get to heaven. And this young man was saying, what can I do? Maybe I can do a mission trip to Ghana, you know? Tell me, Jesus, what can I do to do that? And Jesus says, first of all, there's no one good. Because you see, you might see me as good because of the things that you see me do. But you don't know what goes through this mind. You don't know the character issues that I have that make me imperfect according to God's standards. That salvation has to do with not how you see me, but how God sees me. And the first thing that Jesus tells them is that according to God's standards, no human being is good enough. See, and that's a point that we all need to come to to understand salvation. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, why does Jesus say this? In other words, tell him to do something. Jesus has the, the um, Jesus has an ability, and he used a method all the time, that Jesus goes to where you're at to then bring you to where he wants to be. Okay? He goes to where, from where, to where you're at to then take you where he wants you to be. In other words, he's saying, okay, since you're talking about doing, I want you to keep the commandments. If, if you want to do something, keep the commandments. And listen to what the young man says. He said to him, which one? He said, you shall, not, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you can see the method of Jesus that is working. Because a young man said to him, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? He says, I've been doing all those things, but I still feel empty. Jesus says, bingo! You're getting it? That you've been doing all these things. You've been doing all these things. And yet you're here before me asking me, what else can I do? And Jesus is saying, bingo, you're understanding. That none of those things that you do will earn you salvation. Look how empty you feel. Verse 21, Jesus said to him, now Jesus gives him the answer to what he was asking at the beginning. Remember the first question that asked, the question was, what good thing may I what? Do. Now Jesus is going to give him the answer. What good thing can he do? So if you are also looking for something to do, here is the answer. Okay? The answer is this. This is the whole thing of this story. This is the answer of Jesus to the question. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Go sell what you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. That's the answer to the question. What good thing must I do? Follow me, Jesus said. Now, when he said to this young man, go sell all you have. 
Jesus is playing a psychological game here with this young man. Because this young man comes in front of people. And as he comes in front of people, he's, he's playing this holier-than-thou game. What? I mean, I'll do anything. I'll do anything to serve you. I'll do anything to get to heaven. You see, a lot of times we lie to ourselves. Oh, I'll do anything for God. Really? Really? I'd do anything for God. Some have a hard time even getting here. I'll do anything for God. God is number one in my life. Really? And this young man was saying, I'll do all. You know, I just want to get to heaven no matter what. So Jesus takes him to the point of saying, okay. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. I mean, I'm telling you how to get to heaven. Okay, you want to get to heaven. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor. And I'll give you heaven. Whoa, hold up, hold up. I mean, you don't know how to play, Jesus. Come on. See, Jesus goes deep, deep, deep within us. Don't try to fool God with your games. You want to play? He'll play. You want to play the game? He'll play the game with you. Come on. Oh, you love me more than anything else? I'm number one. Let's go. Let's go. I'll take you to a point to see if you really love me because you need to stop lying to yourself. Probably Jesus didn't need this man to sell anything. But he wanted to help this young man see reality. That his problem was not that he needed to do anything else. His problem was that he really loved other things more than he loved God. You see people, and one of the first things that we have to do to grow in our spiritual lives is to realize that about ourselves. I know that we're taught how to be religious, act religious. I know we're taught, you know, this special move, right? We're taught those things. You know, we're taught little things like, God bless you, my brother. So how are you doing? God is blessing. While inside you're like, my life is terrible. You know, we know the phrases. You know, God is powerful. We learn the religious jargon. And we live under that jargon. And, and we are afraid to be real. Only, and you've heard the saying from me before. You can only reach spirituality by first confronting reality. In other words, you don't want to, you have time for your devotion to tell God, God, you know that I don't even want to spend time with you. Help me to want to spend time with you. But if you keep telling God, that, oh, man, I love you more than anything in the world. And, 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 and. No, God says, listen, listen, look how you live your life. Look at your life. You don't love me more than that. I'm your Santa Claus. I'm the one that blesses your plans. You don't come to me first. You make your plans. And then you ask me to bless it. I'm your little gopher. I'm not your priority. I'm your gopher. So God said, okay, so uh, see the, the title of the sermon today, I entitled it, The Man 
that walked away. The man that walked away. The reason why we can lose heaven is not because we don't do enough, but because we walk away. We walk away. Instead of staying with Jesus. See, this young man didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. That's all he had to do. When I look back at this, if you study this in the scriptures, you will find out that after Jesus picked his 12 disciples, he never asked any other person to follow him except this young man. He asked this young man to become one of his disciples. Jesus saw abilities and talents in this young man that he could use for the gospel. God saw, Jesus saw amazing things in this young man. And he said, follow me. Sell all you have and follow me. Jesus invited him to follow him. But instead... He walked away. Do you know what this young man's name was? Can anyone in here tell me this young man's name? Anyone? I mean, you read the Bible? And you don't know who this young man's name is? We don't even know who his name is. But Peter, who was a fisherman that couldn't even read, didn't have a dime to you finish it off. We know his name real well. Not because he was bringing anything special to the table, but because he followed Jesus. With all of his mistakes, with all of his big mouth, and his attitude, and all these things, he followed Jesus. He stuck with him. And when you're looking at your life, you're looking at, you know, I, I know all of us, we look at ourselves. And we're kind of saying, if I could only do this, if I could only do that, then I will be good enough. You're going to find yourself in the same place as this young man. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, and you're going to find yourself as empty as you feel today. And as empty as this young man. Because the secret of Christianity, the, Christian, the secret of this young man's salvation was not to do anything else but to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. Because in following Jesus, we become transformed from within. When Jesus died on the cross, he bought us back. I want you to know, you need to know what happened there. He redeemed us. He bought us back with his blood. Do you know why he bought us back with his blood? He bought us back so that he could work on you. So he could have the permission. He owns you. Okay, and I gave you this example a while back. 
Okay, when I bought my house, the house was all messed up. I couldn't work on the house and fix it until I made it mine. We have the church going to work on it. Why are we going to be able to work on it this week? Because we signed papers that says now we have the permission to be there. When Jesus died on the cross and he spilled his blood, he bought us. And now the Holy Spirit can come within us. He bought that right. He bought this real estate right here. So that his Holy Spirit could come and transform me. I become transformed not by doing more, but by allowing him in my life. In making him a priority in my life. Don't say... You're willing to do anything for him when you know it's not true. Instead, say, Lord, help me to want to do anything for you. Because if not, you will be fooling yourself just like this young man. Thinking that you are going to do anything. And if you play that game with Jesus, he's going to play it with you. And he's going to show you. That you really don't love him as much as you think. But when he shows you that, don't walk away. Whatever is going on in your life, don't walk away. If you're not perfect, don't walk away. See, Jesus showed that young man that he wasn't perfect. And his problem was not that he wasn't perfect. His problem was that he walked away. Instead of staying. He walked away. And many people today walk away from God because they don't feel good enough. They don't feel like they, they can really do it. They, they look at themselves and they see mistakes in their lives. And, and, and instead, of, instead of staying with Jesus, they walk away. And when you walk away from Christ, that's when you lose it. But God knows your mistakes. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your struggles. Follow him no matter what your mistakes are. Stay with him. Follow him. Learn about him. Make Jesus the center of your life. Don't walk away. Whatever you do today, I don't know what's going on in your life, but don't walk away. The more sins you see in your life, get closer to him. Because he's asking you. See, Jesus knew everything about this young man. He knew. But he walked away. He walked away because... There were some things maybe he didn't want to give up. But those things Jesus had already seen. But you see, if you keep making Jesus number two, number three, and number four in your life, I want you to know that eventually you will walk away. See, walking away doesn't happen in one day. Walking away sometimes takes a long time. Or you will end up walking away. There's only so much time that you can be trying to live Christianity with other things in the place of Jesus. And if you keep making Jesus number two and number three in your, in your life, eventually you will walk away. The disciples were probably saying, Jesus, how can you let this guy get away, man? He's like the answer to our ministry. I mean, don't, I mean, don't, don't let him walk away. This dude's got money. You know, you need to somehow draw him. Come on, hey, hey, come back. He walked away. He was interested in doing, but not being. And today, 
I invite you to not do something else. I invite you to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. And help him walk in your life. And I know that many of you have already been tempted to walk away. Because you say, I've tried and I've tried. And I can't do it because you're looking at yourself. And to you, Jesus gives the same answer. Follow me. Follow me in your weakness. Follow me in your problems. Follow me in your difficulties. No matter what's going on in your life, follow me. Jesus knows him just like he knew this young man. He knows us as follow me. Don't walk away. Don't walk away. Because the answer will always be in Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship you here today. I know that many times we look at ourselves and we don't see ourselves good enough. And we feel like walking away because we feel like we're never going to make it. But in that moment, you also ask us to follow you. Help us to, to follow you. No matter what's going on in our life. No matter when we look at our weaknesses. No matter when we look at our failures. No matter what's we, what goes on in our life. Help us to follow you and to not walk away. So today we ask you to give us the strength. And we thank you for accepting us the way that we are. And for having your Holy Spirit work in us to make us what you want us to be. We ask all this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.